uh, delighted uh, to be part of this uh, seminar series. Uh, so thanks for the invitation. I just want to start off a few minutes of uh, my history here. I published my uh, first study on climate change science in 1974. And for nearly three decades, I was primarily focused uh, on the science of climate change. About 15 years ago, I, I realized actions, at least meaningful actions, are not being taken uh, by you know, the international community by and large. So I, I spent, started spending half my time on the solutions. It's focusing primarily on mitigation. How do you, you know, really bend down the emissions curve? And then four years ago, I published a study and which uh, convinced me that disastrous changes are coming our way well, very soon, about somewhere around eight years from now by 2030. So I started thinking about how do we prepare the public? And that took me to thinking about uh, uh, resilience. So this is my first talk on climate resilience uh, to an academic department. I've been talking to the government of California about this, that we have to prepare the people for this. So that explains the first half of my title. So why the poor three billion? And I think this department, you probably don't need any convincing about why we need to focus on them. But just to give you one quick background, there are roughly three billion people on this planet, give or take half a billion, who either do not have access to uh, modern fuel, energy sources like fossil fuels, or if they have access, they can't afford it. So they are still relying on primitive technologies to meet basic needs such as cooking and lighting. Hi, I, I'm hearing some crosstalk. Is that coming from my side or? Okay. So, up there, uh, Mike. is that okay? Can I keep talk? Can I keep going? Please, please keep going. Yeah. So, this one uh, was a report published by United Nations, the famous IPCC, <clears throat> Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. I think for the first time, that report acknowledged the real seriousness and the catastrophe we are facing. So let me just uh, read out. They say climate change is a threat to human well-being and planetary health with no qualifications, okay? Then they conclude any further delay in concerted global action on adaptation and mitigation will miss a brief and rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. So that's pretty much consistent with what I'm gonna to talk to you about. <clears throat> so Louise mentioned this. So, you know, remember I said, I started working on the solutions about half my time last 15 years. <clears throat> and in 2014, I uh, founded this Bending the Curve initiative with support from the president of the University of California, Janet Napolitano. And I teamed up with 50 faculty. They came from all disciplines, natural sciences, engineering and technology, social sciences, including economics and humanities. We recommended 10 solutions to the climate change problem, again, focusing on mitigation. Uh, I, I need to point that out. But I think ours was one of the first report where we highlighted societal transformation as the highest priority solution. We concluded without societal transformation, just top-down policy alone is not gonna work. The same year under the, uh, with Pope Francis's support, I teamed up with a well-known economist from Cambridge University, Prata Das Gupta, and we organized this meeting, sustainable humanity, sustainable nature, our responsibility. <clears throat> 
And uh, at the end of each such meeting, we directly uh, brief Pope Francis. That's a team of scientists and uh, <clears throat> academics and faith leaders who attended that meeting. Normally we, uh, we brief the Pope in his receiving room or they, they call it Pope's palace. But this Pope being known as people's Pope, he met us at the parking lot just inside uh, the Basilica, St. Peter's uh, Basilica. So I brief, I was just given all of two minutes. He was uh, rushing to uh, some major event. So I mentioned to him about the seriousness of the climate change. Then I informed him what I presented at that meeting, that about 50% of the emissions are from the richest 1 billion people. Then I told him about the poorest 3 billion and how their contribution to the climate emission is about 5% or less, yet they're going to suffer the worst consequences. And then uh, uh, at the time he was smiling when this picture was taken, he was asking me, what is it he can do about it? And then I mentioned to him, this is really a moral ethical problem and he being the moral leader of the world can have a huge role. A year later, I'm not claiming it was my meeting which made him do that. He uh, came up with this climate encyclical, Laudato Si. And there he had a famous sentence, which I love that sentence, cry of the earth should be heard with the cry of the poor. And then we, we, we had a declaration and we said the solution to the problem requires changing attitude towards nature. And more importantly, change in attitude towards each other. <clears throat> Three years later in 2017, by the time it became clear to me, climate change is a huge health problem, human health problem. So we need to pivot to that. I also felt based on our past track record that the focus on the health could get more support from the public. So uh, we organized this meeting, we concluded the health is a major climate crisis <clears throat> and listed out a bunch of solutions uh, what to do about it. So I come to the point, remember I, I mentioned to you that uh, a paper I published four years ago was what moved me towards resilience. So this was in 2018, although I started this work in 2017, published with uh, my former student, uh, uh, Professor Yang Yam Shu. He's at uh, Texas A&M now as a faculty. And David Victor, uh, he's a well-known uh, political scientist. What we did, the black curve is what UN was using. And they, they said the warming, uh, one and a half degree warming would not happen till 2040. Our analysis showed that now it's gonna happen 10 years earlier, 2030, give or take about two to three years from natural variability. So degree and a half warming is what we are all trying to keep the warming below, but that's nothing we do can, is gonna stop that, except some drastic changes like geoengineering. So if your current form, you know, if this uh, factors in all the Paris Accord and all these things. So when the planet crosses a degree and a half warming, I am convinced climate change will transition to climate disruption worldwide. That disruption has already started, I'll, I'll mention to you, but it's still not worldwide, okay? So let me start with where we are now. This is the IPCC Working Group 1 report. That's basically, they talk about the physical science basis. This curve shows temperature records for the last 2000 years. Of course, before 1850, it was reconstructed. They're what we call proxy records, not really measured with thermometers for I mean, analysis of tree ring, ice core, et cetera, et cetera. So what we see in this is to, by 2014, the warming crossed the one degree threshold, okay? 
So that is a warming unprecedented in more than 2000 years. This is the conclusion of the IPCC report. And now I'm talking about another eight years, it's gonna cross degree and a half. That is the 50% amplification of the warming we have experienced, okay? The thing which has changed fundamentally in terms of our uh, understanding of climate change is that this global warming has led to new weather extremes. It started becoming clear about 10, 10 years ago from 2010 onwards, when it rose about the background noise, now we know extreme heat, the frequency of that has increased about 180% uh, in many places. Heavy rainfall, where it's raining, it's pouring. Drought, uh, about 70% increase in droughts in the dry regions of the planet. It has led to huge fires. And of course, California is a poster child for the fires. Uh, in 2020 alone, 4 million acres burned. And when I say 4 million doesn't register, our total forested area is about 30 million acres. Okay, so about 12, 13% burned just in one year. Because the ocean is getting acidification because it's absorbing the carbon dioxide. Many uh, places in the ocean, we are showing we are seeing less oxygen, deoxygenation of the ocean. And, and the most famous statement to me was released by the normally conservative American Meteorological Society. I don't mean conservative in a political sense, conservative in terms of scientific sense. They're very, very, very careful because half their membership is uh, uh, weather forecasters and who have always been skeptical about climate change. They said, we are witnessing new weather extremes because we have made a new climate. So that issue is settled. That global warming is leading to weather extremes. In some instances, the frequency and in other instances, the intensity of the weather extreme. So all this is what persuaded me a few years ago. We as scientists, we need to think about this just not in terms of mitigation. We have lost the luxury of just focusing on the mitigation. We need to think about resilience. And I spent quite a bit of time trying to understand the meaning and the definition of resilience. It is still uh, quite vague. And many use different uh, so, uh, interpretation of resilience, but this is what I have uh, picked up. So it is a capacity to prepare and plan for absorb, recover, and from and adapt to climate risks. That resilience has to happen at the individual level, community level, the city level, or a state or a nation. As I understand, resilience is part of three distinctly different uh, aspects of you know, uh, dealing with climate change. First is mitigation. That is how you reduce the risks of climate change. And hopefully you can reduce it su sufficiently so that it can be manageable. And that comes in adaptation, dealing with the manageable risks. Neither of that can happen without societal transformation. So all three are part and parcel of this. So give, given that, that's what I'm taking you for the rest of the talk about how do you uh, uh, build the resilience and what are the constraints. So I stop, start with the top 1 billion. And so we, that's all of us here, part of that, uh, unsustainable consumption of coal, oil, and gas. Okay. I, I make a particular distinction. I'm not talking about unsustainable consumption of material goods. It is that we are using outdated fuel which is coal, oil, and gas, okay? And that's contributing about 50%. This number is still debated. This is what I presented at the Vatican. It's based on data I had for 2005 to 2010, so 50%. Compare that with the bottom 3 billion. I personally took this picture. I spent my sabbatical of three months 
traveling in villages in India. I started with my hometown village in South India and stopped in various uh, regions, rural areas, until uh, Himalayas. So this was my uh, the last stop. And I was a uh, paying guest of this woman. You know, she was uh, uh, in a village, small village, and she was running what you would call a bed and breakfast. And uh, so she's just cooking my morning breakfast. Okay, she and her husband were running this. This is just not her. I know 650 million people in India alone rely on these. And uh, I lived in a house like this when I was young with my grand grandparents. So their total contribution is only about 5% of the CO2 emissions, primarily by cutting down wood and other uh, stuff, okay? So how did I get into this, uh, this cooking, et cetera? In the 1997 to 1999 period, I did a, a teaming up with Paul Crutzen from Germany, you know, the person who started the Anthropocene and Mitra from India. He was the director general of research in India. So we did this experiment looking at air pollution from India with about six aircraft uh, from, you know, many European countries joined us, but 250 scientists. What we found to our shock is this, what now is known as atmospheric brown clouds, massive clouds of three kilometers thick. How do we know three kilometers thick? We flew into this up and down. It was widespread and I'm just showing you one part of this. The major constituent in that aerosol in addition to sulfates and nitrates is black carbon soot. Black carbon absorbs sunlight and, and that's how it heats the atmosphere. We found the deposition of this soot melting the uh, glaciers. It increased atmospheric solar heating and disrupted the monsoon. And it called what's called dimming of the surface. That's why the sky, when you have particles, is hazy. It cuts down the sunlight, which decreased evaporation from the ocean and decreased monsoon rainfall. More than that, three million worldwide die each year, mainly in the rural areas, from inhalation of black carbon loaded cooking smoke indoors. So it's a huge public health problem, primarily amongst women and children, and also a huge issue in terms of climate change. So that's how I got into this. So we took all of our data, this is a paper published in Nature, and what we found was 75% of the black carbon was coming from biomass cooking. Imagine that, just giving them cleaner cooking access would solve 75% of the smoke issue. Okay, so we did that in this model and the top one is where with the current smoke. And then we said we substituted with this improved cook stove and uh, believe it or not, this particular cook stove was developed in uh, Fort Collins, Colorado. And we found about two thirds of the pollution problem in India would go away. And uh, sadly, uh, the this, this science has been there for 15, 17 years till the problem is there. The government is taking some steps, but not enough. So I want to take you to a video I took during my sabbatical, just to give you a feeling of what I'm talking about, okay? So that's the uh, cooking. Uh, this lady is cooking for our, uh, my team were there for our breakfast, so it was early morning. Really the most delicious breakfast I've ever taken. And you can see how the snake escapes the roof. And I want to show you this is the middle of the day. So their lighting is from kerosene and what leaks through the roof from the sun. So when the women are working hard, their children are, you know, the boys are playing quite the 
girls travel a couple of kilometers to get wood and water. So this is the woman and her daughter-in-law. Imagine how carefully she has to put that part because that, that two parts has to serve her family of five and me and my wife, okay? She can't afford to lose a single drop. Look at how carefully she puts the second part on her. Not a drop wasted. While that's going on, just 20 kilometers away, this is uh, close to the famous city of Mumbai, but it's this huge lake and they can't access this water because that water is going to uh, Mumbai or Bombay. Just 15 kilometers from her is this huge resort. This is what I meant by the top one billion. I'm driving back now, back to Mumbai, passing through slums and slums. And I was so depressed, feeling really uh, a sadness, but within half an hour of landing in my four-star hotel in Bombay, I completely forgot all about it. And the cold glass of beer drove everything away. To me, that's symptomatic of how we can live in denial of what's happening around us. So I started this project Surya at UC San Diego. Surya means sun in Sanskrit. And Next Leaf Analytics is a, a, a NGO started by my daughter, to, uh, working, primarily working on uh, problems of uh, the rural areas in Africa and India. And Terry is a nonprofit institution. So we did a study of 5,000 homes, replacing it with these cook stoves, but we developed a business model. It was published in Nature. And this is what we did. We recruited a bank, had the bank give the woman a loan, and then she would use our smart stoves. How do I know she would use it? My daughter put smart sensors, which were sending data to her, uh, you know, uh, her company or NGO in Los Angeles. And then based on the hours they use, I would calculate the reduction carbon CO2 equivalent and we would pay them. It turned out the women could not get the money from the bank because it is about three miles away, they have to walk. And once they go there, they were treated very poorly because they were not properly active with tie and suit and all this stuff. So they had to wait four or five hours in the bank. So my uh, other daughter, uh, Tara, she developed this device where they could get paid by a uh, mobile system. So we documented that rewarding them or giving this sensor-enabled climate financing really increased the uptake. But we realized the fundamental issue is not stoves, it's energy access. Give them energy access, clean energy. They'll figure out how to cook, okay? So I showed you India. This is a study we're just finishing. We looked at the hotspots for drying, and this is what came up. What this is, is change in the precipitation minus the change in the vapor pressure deficit. See, as the planet warms, the saturation vapor pressure increases so much, the surface layer is getting drier and drier and drier, okay? So we just plotted the hot spots where the difference is less than minus 20. So it could be minus 25, minus 30, et cetera. And you see the entire Southwest, Amazon, and the entire Northern Africa and China and parts of Australia, et cetera. So it's a global issue, this uh, droughts. This is what IPC said, 70% increase in that. And just yesterday, two days ago, was this paper was published in which uh, this group concluded Amazon rainforest is losing its resilience, okay? They have looked at about 40 years of, uh, 30 years of microwave satellite data. And they said it has the signs of dieback, 
with profound implication for biodiversity, carbon storage, and climate change. So this kind of crisis is already there, climate crises, climate disruption. One thing what really concerns me is the domino effect of multiple things happening at the same time. This is something based on what's in California. So the warming, you know, uh, as you know, California is uh, about 40% of our forest area has been subject to burning. It comes primarily from the warming creates this vapor pressure deficit, that the saturation vapor pressure is increasing, but the atmosphere is not catching up with it. So that causes drying. That drying leads to uh, amplification of forest fires. I'm not claiming the driving causes the fires. The fires are caused uh, maybe by people, but climate is acting as an amplifier. And once you lose the trees, it gives them more runoff. Remember our water, part of it comes from uh, snow melt. So the water is running off with no trees to hold them and that causes drought. On the left-hand side, our snow is early melting early in the season because the boundary layer is either uh, warmer or drier and less precipitation is falling as snow. So it runs off. So this kind of a domino effect is happening in multiple ecosystems and, and, the, and the author's point of what's happening in the Amazon, okay? So now my point about uh, the poorest 3 billion. This shows, this curve shows carbon emissions, okay? By the 7.8 billion. Go to the right extreme, roughly, three quarters of billion people, their emission is half a percent of a global CO2. They're about 10% of the population. That was what I just thought, mine is. <laughs> so mine includes the three billion part of here. And then their estimate for the top 1 billion is about 38% of global CO2. My estimate was 50, but that was in 2010. So roughly, this half the population is causing global warming. 86% of global CO2 is coming from the top three and a half billion. And we know when there is this one and a half degree warming and if there are cliffs to go, who would go down that cliff first? The ones on the right hand side, okay? So why do I, you know, normally when we talk about rich and poor, it's always in terms of developed nations, developing nations, least developing nations. I instead prefer to talk about population because just look at California, one of the most wealthiest economists in the US, 22% of Californians live in poverty, okay? So this poor 3 billion, there is also a sizable number of them in a developed nations. It's also, it's better to talk in terms of people, in terms of countries. So this that study, we looked at the impact of fires. Remember I said, I'm pivoting to health. This study was led by a, a neuroscientist in US, she said, Jyoti Mishra. She happens to be my uh, son's wife. And what she found was that those exposed to the fire, this is the campfire. It was the record-breaking fire in 2018, but this record was broken in 2020. 2018 was 2 million acres burned, 2020 was 4 million. She found the incidence in this exposed population, the hatched one, PTSD and major depressive disorder and general anxiety disorder all grew by 50%, okay? So there is, and, and we are not the only one, there are many groups. I think uh, the Lancet Commission and our own CDC is now thinking climate change is going to have a major impact on mental health. That's called eco-anxiety. So I, I talked to you about depressing things, can it get any worse? Unfortunately, yes it can, due to what's called fat tails. These are the low probability, high impact events, okay? All the things I talked to you about one and a half, it's 50% probability. 
but there's five to ten percent, one per, one to five percent probability in which things could be much worse. And you say, oh, you know, that could be oh, five percent is so low. Let me give you an example. If I told you that aircraft you're going to take for your next flight as a one to five percent probability of crashing, you won't go there. But we are sending our children and grandchildren on that aircraft, which has this low probability of high impact events. Let me just share with you one of them. This was a prediction by the Princeton University model, NOAA and Princeton as the NASA group joined the Cook et al, published in uh, eight years ago. They said, what will happen by 2100 if we continue merrily as we are with unchecked emissions? This is what they showed. Over a third of the planet, half the planet, would be subject to severe drought. Look at the Amazon, the whole Southwest, the entire Mediterranean region, India, China, everywhere. So this is a low probability. And the other way to think about it is the 5% probability this could happen sooner, not 100 years, 50 years from now. Okay. So let me now get back to the uh, fun part of my talk, if there is a fun part here, is resilience, okay? Resilient nature, resilient humanity. I'm not gonna talk to you about mitigation, that's, you know, there are thousands of papers on this. I'm gonna just talk to you about this, these two aspects, transformation and adaptation. What I found was all our models we used were deficient. There were no human beings in our models. They were lacking the human nature interactions, okay? I'm getting to that, but what do I mean by climate risk? It's basically product of two, as according to, I'm, I'm taking a, a report published by a bunch of uh, economists and social scientists. There is a threat. The drought is a threat, forest fire is a threat, a major snowstorm coming in your way is a threat. But the risk also depends on vulnerability, how sensitive you are to this. If you're living on, the, on a beachfront home, you're highly sensitive to sea level rise. Exposure and adaptive capacity. So that adaptive capacity depends hugely on your economic status. The poorest one, three billion, probably have very little capacity to adapt, okay? So that's, those are the two things we, we need to keep track of. And I'm now taking you to what now climate scientists we are thinking. So we can't deal with the climate change in isolation. There are three intersecting problems reaching crisis stage. First is climate, biodiversity loss. There have been series of reports in the last six months and climate change could accelerate the biodiversity loss. Species extinction is claimed could go to 14% with one and a half degree warming. Okay. And of course, thank you. I think I can wrap it up. And the third issue is inequality. That was what I was talking to you. Okay. We need to broaden our thinking and consider these three issues as interconnected. Fortunately, at least in my view, I don't know how many share, there's still time to bend the curve and avoid the unmanageable risks. So this is a study we published last year. I've been working on this with my uh, uh, Yang Yang Shu, who is Texas A&M, and this, uh, Anthony Versace is an eco economic, economic student, graduate student. So we published this study where we explicitly included human behavioral changes in the natural system interaction, okay? So, you know, not what I call natural system model, this is our climate model. They basically address what society should do, right? We well, should cut the emissions by 50%, you should cut the emissions, those are what other climate models do. But bringing in a social system model, SSM, we have the capability to address what society can do, what are its limitations, and then contrast that with what society should do. So the right-hand side is what we have, it's called earth system models, carbon cycle, climate system, it, it estimates the CO2 change and the temperature 
is simulated by that. What we do is we constructed a set of differential equations to treat the society policy, policy response in terms of response time inertia of the system. Okay, once it responds, it creates new technologies, renewables, and then they're scaled up, scaling up, it's called diffusion process to make the planet carbon neutral. And A is this atmospheric carbon extraction. We all now know just reaching carbon neutrality is not enough. We have to suck out at least half a trillion tons, 500 billion tons of CO2 out of the air. If you do that with fossil fuel, that will be a disaster. You want to do it with renewables. Then I have this climate adaptation bottom three billion. See, as the planet warms, they need energy source. If the society doesn't give them access to renewables and make it possible for them to afford it, they're gonna to go to fossil fuels, okay? So those are the interactions we included. And I wanna conclude with our results. Just, uh, I, I'm looking at it, it's just too complex. Let me just focus on one thing here. The dashed line is the fossil fuels. We found societal response makes the fossil fuel curve bend by 2025. When the fossil fuel contribution to energy bends, the emission by CO2 start bends at the same time. But the CO2 concentration to bend takes 22 years. That is because of the inertia from the policy response to technology development and scaling up. And then you find the warming curve on the last right-hand side takes another 28 years. So from the time society responds, there is a 50 year gap. In fact, none of the scenarios we considered, we could get the warming below two degrees, okay? In because of the response. So think of it as what society can do. Uh, this one addresses the climate justice issue. Just focus on the blue curve. It's in the blue curve, society, produces energy access to the bottom 3 billion, make it affordable to them, the top 1 billion contribute. And that, the warming still peaks and is able to come down to about two and a half, it's still trending down, okay? It, it comes below two degrees only by 2150. But if the top 1 billion that tells the bottom 3 billion, oh, we, don't, we did it on our own, you do it on your own, and then the emission goes up, the warming goes up. So to me, it's clear, even if not for altruistic or egalitarian reasons, for our own pure selfish interest of keeping the global warming low, we've got to provide clean energy access to the 3 billion. And uh, I'm just going to this is what I'm doing in terms of we are developing an education protocol under the bending the curve. It's being now taught in many colleges in the US. I'm thinking of taking it to all the uh, conservative states. The last one, how do we get the public support? I strongly believe we need to form an alliance between science, policy, and faith. It's a moral issue and uh, faith leaders know how to talk about it more than us scientists. And this is something I have been advancing, working with Catholic churches and evangelical churches. The last point I want to mention is that I'm excited. Scott Peters is a, my, my congressman here. And I've been working with him for the last 10 years. There is a bipartisan bill. They're passing on national climate adaptation and resilience strategy. It's one of the best news I've heard because we have to stop pretending they're going to stop this warming just with mitigation. We are going to, but at a level where a lot of people are going to suffer. So we need to have the adaptation and resilience. I'm excited US is still pushing this. So I'm going to end there that there is still time to protect people. Thank you, Louis. Thank you. Thank you so much. Shall I, shall I stop sharing the screen? Um, well, we still want to see you, but yes, you can stop sharing the screen. And what we're, what we're going to do is um, 
ask the people who are online to either raise their hand and or put their comment in chat. And I'm going to do my best to alternate to uh, take questions from the audience and from those of you who are online. And Stefan's going to make this possible because he's got a tag on who's online. So I'll begin with the audience. Comments or questions from anyone? Yes. Thank you. Um, so you're bending the curve uh, framework that you're trying to get into colleges. Um, most people don't go to college. Uh, so why not uh, try to uh, focus on high schools instead where you get everybody, at least in this country? Perfect question. Uh, yeah, I talked, I talked about the bending the curve because that's the one we have now uh, completed. And what we're starting on is the K to 12 program. And we had a big summit with our governor and all that uh, three years ago, just before COVID started. And that's now being taken up as a partnership between uh, University of California and Colorado State University, CSU. It's a huge system. And my focus is on two fronts. We, we are developing a private sector version to all the people working on working in industries Remember, we need them. We need to educate our CEOs that uh, for their own self-interest, they got to get involved. But, and this is something I'm discussing with Cornell, uh, uh, your dean, about starting a corporate uh, program at Cornell to educate. Uh, you know, not only our business school students, but also this. But none of this is going to help unless we unpack climate change from all the issues that divide us Americans. You know, we are divided into two halves and we are divided no matter what the issue is. So the question is, how do we reach out to the public, right? You know, we are a democracy and we need to get our laws passed. And this is where I'm advancing the issue of teaming up with the faith leaders and develop, I'm not talking about developing a one quarter course, I'm talking about developing easily deliverable materials prepared by communication experts, <clears throat> and then work with the local church leaders and other religious leaders to take it to the public. Thank you. You. Other comments from the audience? Ed. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. I'm wondering to what extent, um, to the extent that climate change affects development in people's lifestyles and vice versa, that the people, as they get more, you know, middle income, they start to consume differently. What are the assumptions on the state of development and this interaction with uh, the climate change? You know, especially if you're looking at a five, a fifty-year time horizon, are we assuming that? You know, uh, I don't know which way the causality is going to flow, but what I'm just wondering what the assumptions are on the status of development, especially for the bottom three billion people. Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. I mean, it's. It's such a fundamental issue. I must say, I don't have an answer to the question you are asking. So let me just speculate on a couple of things. That uh, we need to reduce this inequality even independent of climate change, okay? But what climate change brings to the table is the fact that if we don't give them energy access, energy access, remember, is critical for economic development, right? That's why there is a hue and cry with the whole Ukraine issue of uh, Europeans would lose that energy access from Russia. So that's a fundamental thing in development. So for the poorest, we need to give them energy access. And my research shows for our own self-interest because Climate change is exactly like COVID. 
an infection anywhere is disease everywhere. Same way emissions anywhere in the planet is global warming everywhere, okay? But I'm also thinking about uh, the reason I'm thinking in terms of, remember I showed you California, 22% uh, of our population is in poor. And the other thing I'm thinking about people in the age group of about 20 to 30, 35. And I don't see how they're gonna enjoy the same things I enjoyed when I came to this country when I was 28. And I don't know if they're gonna have access to buying houses and all that, at least in California with our fires. I don't think anyone, I, there may come a point where insurance may not insure our homes. So what are the young people gonna do? So this development issue cuts across cultures, cuts across nations and cuts across economic level, except for the top 1 billion. I think they will somehow manage to survive and have resilience. One more question. Thank you for a, a very uh, stimulating presentation um, and for appropriately pointing out the urgency of the problem. Uh, in that light, uh, in thinking about more ur sort of urgent solutions, what is your thoughts? What are your thoughts about a very specific uh, solution, which is carbon taxes? Yeah, clear. You know, I think you see what we found uh, in our study uh, is that we didn't consider carbon tax explicitly. What we did include was capital investment in new technologies. And we found to shrink this gap from 50 years to 20 years. That's what it would take to cut down that gap between people saying it's an important issue and the curve bending. We found a factor of 10 to 20 increase in the initial investment in these technologies would, would do a major, major impact on cutting down that uh, inertia gap. So how does the initial mess come in? Could come from the private sector or could come from carbon tax. So we didn't make a distinction, but clearly I just don't see this happening. We're reducing the warming below two degrees without a carbon tax. Even at $50 a ton, that would do the job. Okay, well, that wraps up our time. Thank you again so much for an extremely stimulating presentation. And um, we appreciate everyone's questions. And class is over. <laughs>